This podcast was produced from a webinar. For a more interactive experience with visuals, visit myamericannurse.com forward slash webinars. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Julie Cullen and I am the managing editor of American Nurse Journal, the official peer reviewed journal of the American Nurses Association. Um, I'll be serving as your moderator today for today's webinar which is called When There Are No More Nurses, a discussion to empower nurses to build a better professional future. Our two experts, Dr. Eileen Fry Bowers and Dr. Cinda Hilton Rushton, will discuss actions nurses can take to reimagine nursing's relationship with the public as a social covenant rather than a social contract. Before we get started, I wanna go over just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will last about 45 minutes and you can submit questions in the Q&A box that you see on your screen. And we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. If you experience any technical problems during the webinar, just let us know through the Q&A and one of our producers will help you. And finally, a full recording of the webinar will be available on demand shortly after the presentation ends and all attendees will receive a link by email. You'll be able to access it free of charge as often as you like. So that takes care of that, and let's get started. Please welcome Dr. Eileen Fry Bowers and Dr. Cinda Hilton Rushton. Hello, everyone. Really great to see you today, and great to be here with Eileen. Hello, everybody. It is terrific to be here as well, and I'm so pleased to be here with my colleague, Dr. Cinda Rushton. So it's no surprise really to anyone that um, nurses have really shown up uh, in ways that we all uh, recognize. But there's also this inherent tension between being rated as the most trusted and the reality of how many nurses are practicing in their work environment. So today we want to really re-examine this relationship and the framework for how we engage with the public so that we can make sure that we actually have a sustainable workforce and how we do that uh, as partners and allies with the public is part of what we want to talk about today. So before we begin, we think it's really important to talk about the context in which healthcare delivery and healthcare systems exist in today's world. Has been on COVID and sort of this post COVID environment. We think it's important to take a step back and look at the state of healthcare and the state of the nursing workforce prior to COVID. We recognize that things were not well even before COVID. It's just that COVID really amplified um, some of the shortcomings that we've been dealing with for many, many years. And we also need to recognize that there are societal factors that influence the delivery of healthcare, influence the education of nurses, and influence the interaction between nurses and the public. And so, you know, we think about in the, the, the decade leading up to the pandemic, we had movements like the Me Too movement. We had things like Brexit. We've had a lot of other social upheaval in various parts of our nation as well as the world that all have impact on the delivery of healthcare and of course nurses because we are the largest number of providers within that system. And while it's important to think about the impact on nurses as a profession, we also have to think about the individual impact these factors have on nurses themselves. So if you, if you think about uh, how all of that came together during COVID, it uh, was sort of a tsunami of all these factors really happening simultaneously. Uh, if you think about what was happening in our society, uh, the, the violence that was happening, uh, people of color, how we were um, seeing lots of division in, in our world in, in the external environment that found its way into our practice environment. 
And if you think about what happened early on in COVID, uh, there was a lot of, you know, hand clapping and, you know, nurses are heroes. And yet, even though that may have been well-intentioned to, to acknowledge what nurses were doing, I think nurse, many nurses felt offended by the ways that that kind of a response felt um, like it was putting them on a pedestal that they did not want to be on, first of all. And second of all, that it felt as if it was denying their humanity, that somehow nurses were expected to be heroic. We, we know nurses worked during COVID when they were sick. We know that uh, nurses uh, died from COVID and uh, over a third of the deaths uh, in healthcare professionals were nurses. So yeah. this idea of self-sacrifice really came into the fore as an assumption that in a way, nurses service was taken for granted when you put that in the context of the thousands of people who died of COVID, we begin to see how these ripples begin to create the environment where nursing practice has really um, been degraded. Alongside that were very uh, troubling trends that started before COVID about violence against nurses and other healthcare professionals for that matter. But what was disturbing during COVID, I think, was for many nurses, our fuel is our patients. And when we felt that our patients were turning against us either by physical, verbal um, violence, or were questioning our commitment or our um, truth telling about what was happening in the healthcare environment, it really, eroded our sense of why we're here. And of course, alongside that, we have seen the uh, degrading of our workforce. The uh, National uh, State Boards of Nursing reported over 100,000 nurses left the workforce after COVID. And over 600,000 are expected to leave in the next few years. So this whole sort of context left um, Eileen and I wondering about what would happen if there were no more nurses and how might we be able to deliver care? How could we sustain uh, our healthcare uh, workforce in the midst of these challenges? So we um, really spent some time pondering that question and wondering what the public might say when we pose the question, who will care for you if you need nursing care or medical care? How do we begin to change this, this tsunami of um, environments where nurses are practicing to be able to actually start to think about a new relationship with the people that we're serving every single day? Eileen, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the opportunities that we have is to step back and look at the language that we use around our interactions uh, with the public. And I think as we, as you and I have talked so often, and as we sort of dove into this conversation, we really started to think about how that that relationship has been described historically. And one of the things that we often hear is this term that, you know, nurses have a social contract with the public. And I really wanted to understand what that meant. So I really kind of dove into that a little bit farther. And when we think about this social contract uh, perspective, what that usually means is that the public agrees to allow nurses to determine what their practice is, to determine how one becomes licensed as a nurse, to determine how we hold one another accountable for our practice. And then at the end, the, the sort of the public act of that is to give us that permission, so to speak. 
to develop ourselves as professionals, as, as licensed professionals. And then of course the flip is that we as nurses will provide care and it will be of a certain quality. And, you know, given all that has occurred, and not just again with COVID, but leading up to COVID and some of the other things that we've seen just historically in the way that nursing um, has been supported and, and addressed, um, and you know whether or not they've been given the resources that they need to do their jobs, I think we need to step away from that, that language of using the term social contract because the relationship that nurses have with the public is much more than simply, um, you can care for me if I give you the opportunity to, to be licensed and protect your title and protect your profession. What really better describes the relationship with the public is really a promise. And it's a bi-directional promise. You know, nurses enter into the most intimate spaces with patients. And there's, there's a level of trust that occurs uh, and it, it's bi-directional. And so when we talk about covenant, um, covenant harkens back, uh, you know, millennia. And it really is, a, a, really stands for a, a, almost a moral promise that occurs between two parties. And I want to make very clear here that I'm not uh, referring to sort of that virtue narrative of nursing, that, that nurses promise to always take care of patients and so forth. But what I really want to emphasize that this is a promise that is between two parties, nursing and the public. And so nurses certainly promise to provide, you know, the best quality care for the patients. But there is a piece that the patient provides as well. This is a bi-directional relationship. Contracts are transactional. It's a list of you know, duties that one side has and a list of duties that the other side have and we hold each other accountable. Covenant, I think, elevates this relationship and it really is a better way of describing the relationship that we as nurses have with the public. Um, it really does describe this bi-directional promise to one another so that if nurses extend themselves uh, physically, emotionally uh, to care for their patient population, that the patient population on the other hand um, needs to care for nurses as well, needs to recognize what nurses are bringing to the table in terms of knowledge, experience, skills, uh, and, and so forth. So I think we, you know, we need to think about the language that we're using, first of all, to describe this important relationship. So Eileen brings up some really important questions, I think, at this juncture. Um, how do we see ourselves? So what we want to pause for a moment here is for you to reflect on this question. How do you respond when someone asks you, what do you do? And what language do you use to describe your role as a nurse? So just take a moment and just reflect on the last time somebody asked you that question. How did you answer it? Uh, what did you say? So maybe you haven't thought about the answer to that question and maybe you just have a road answer that you give everywhere so one of the things that we'd like to uh, invite you to give us some feedback on is how many of you have ever used the statement i am just a nurse and we'd like for you to um, indicate that in the poll uh, either yes or no and just try to be as honest with yourself as you can. Um, this is not about judging ourselves, but it's also about just checking in with this particular statement. How many of you have ever used the statement, I am just a nurse? And I think to add to, to Cinda's uh, request for honesty, think about all aspects of your life, the professional setting, 
but also the personal setting or when you're engaging with somebody at a party or on the sidelines of your child's soccer game and somebody asks you what you do for a living. How do you phrase that? So let's see where we are. Looks like about 42% or so say they've used that phrase and 57 say no. Interesting. Because what is so important, I think, that we have to realize as nurses is how we speak about ourselves. And so one of the things to begin this pro process of actually claiming who we really are is to extinguish that word just from our description of ourselves. So what would it be like to be able to say when someone asks you, what do you do? To stand proud and say, I am a nurse. There's a difference in sort of being apologetic about our role and stepping into the power of being a nurse, which as Eileen was pointing out, we have an incredible role in what happens to the people that we take care of. And I think there are times when we overlook the significance of what we do by using words like just to describe our contributions. So this is a really important part of shifting that relationship with the public and with ourselves of claiming what we do, why we do it, and how we do it in a way that is skillful, that requires lots of education and training and reflects a, a whole set of values that are important in our profession. So along with that is this idea that all nurses matter. There's no less than or more than in our profession. If we can truly claim the power of our profession by every single person in our profession, that we all belong, then I think we really have the opportunity to create a space where we can collectively describe our work in a different way. Eileen, you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, certainly. You know, I, I just want to comment on a, a, a comment that's come through in the chat and, and um, sort of it adds on to what you're talking about here, but also goes back to um, my comments about the relationship. And, and one of our colleagues has pointed out that um, this covenant is also between nurses to each other and appreciating the work that each other does. So I think this, go, this um, you know, it's not just a covenant between uh, nursing and, and the public, but we have to recognize that we have that promise and relationship with one another as well. And so I think, again, it goes back to your statements about every nurse is valued, every nurse matters, and we need to you know, take care of one, an one another as much as we take care of the public. Um, you know, there's always that saying that there is strength in numbers. And I think many of the, us have found that strength with our, co you know, in uh, with our colleagues. Uh, and we do need to recognize that uh, what we bring to the table is a unique set of skills, a unique body of knowledge and that it matters and we matter. So when Eileen and I got together um, to write this piece, it's, it actually started with a blog uh, about when there are no more nurses during COVID. And then we, we really dove into it. And um, for those of you who've had a chance to, to look at the article, um, we, we propose some ways that we might actually strengthen this relationship uh, between nurses and the public. And um, it, it involves all of us. I mean, it involves nurses and leaders and organizations and policymakers. And Eileen, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about 
this piece of um, how others can support us to support nursing as a profession, but also to, to elevate and to honor the roles that nurses play every day. Sure, thank you, Cinda. Um, again, you know, I'm just scanning some of the comments that are being placed in the chat and somebody picked up on this very uh, quickly about, you know, talking about our relationship with the public, but then asking, well, what about our relationship with health systems? And so I think that this, you know, you're hitting on that right now about what, what is it that we can do to um, ensure that it, it's not just this individual nurse, individual patient relationship, but it extends uh, beyond that. I think, I think though it does, number one, start with the conversation with our individual patients. Each and every time a nurse engages in care, it's really important for nurses to explain what they are doing, why they are doing it, almost in an educational process, not simply about the care itself, but you're also educating um, what nurses know and the skill that goes into the care that is being provided, the education, the unique expertise. So I think there is a beginning at, at the individual patient level. And then that needs to be carried up within our health systems. I think you know we really have to have conversations about the value of nursing within health systems. You know, for years we have heard the conversation or the narrative that nursing is part of the bed cost. Um, nurses education and skills are not equivalent to a bed. Um, we need to be able to value what nurses contribute to the healthcare system and put a number to it. Until we are able to really quantify how nurses make a difference within the delivery of healthcare, it becomes really hard to push for the resources that we require. So some of the things that, um, you know, there's, there are efforts taking place uh, um, currently to look at um, quantifying uh, the care that is provided within the healthcare space, the care that is specifically nurse-driven care um, and, and delivered by nurses. I think that is one very important place to start because it allows us to leverage uh, what we do in, in language that health systems and policymakers understand, which really, you know, um, has to do with resource utilization. I think, you know, also we have to work within our health systems to uh, promote policies that allow nurses to work uh, not only at the at to the level of their education and training, but to work in psychologically and physically safe environments recognizing that nurses do put their own well-being, both psychological and physical well-being at risk when they take care of patients, whether it be uh, working in an environment where we may be exposed to uh, patients who may become violent, uh, whether we're working in an environment where we, we ourselves may be exposed to communicable disease, we need to make sure that our health systems and policymakers understand that we deserve protections just like any other uh, job occupation or occupation that is exposed to hazards. I think we also um, need to continue to build on opportunities for nurses to sort of have that seat at a table and be decision makers <laughs> within healthcare systems, whether that is through shared governance, robust shared governance, uh, whether that is through continued efforts to have nurses move into positions of leadership, whether that be on boards of health systems, whether that be, uh, you know, again, in roles that are beyond just the chief nurse officer, um, but to be able to be, you know, in roles like the chief operating officer, the chief financial officer, the chief executive officer, to really be able to bring a nursing lens to those roles in order to ensure that the contributions of, nursing, of nurses and nursing to the delivery of healthcare are truly recognized um, and are communicated by people who have lived those experiences. So Eileen uh, really has highlighted 
uh, all these aspects of where we might have leverage points to start recalibrating and reimagining this relationship with the public. And I want to I want to kind of go back to one of the things that she talked about. And one of the reasons we asked the question about how we describe ourselves, the narrative we tell about ourselves is a reflection of what other people are going to also uh, understand our role to be. And so every one of us has the opportunity to be very intentional and mindful about describing who we are, what we stand for, why our work matters. And if you think about our relationship with our patients, as Eileen was saying, um, a lot of times they have some outdated notions of what nurses do. And it's our opportunity to reintroduce ourselves, to say, yes, I am a nurse and here's what we will be doing together. So how do we partner with the public in a different way? So one of the things uh, that was an outgrowth of this interest in this topic was um, I had the opportunity to work with Susan Reinhardt at AERP, and we created uh, a blog on the 10 things the public can do to support nurses. And these are pretty simple, but it was interesting. We did a, a little tiny survey to ask nurses, what do you want the public to do? And this is really where these 10 things came from. The first thing, you won't be surprised, is we want them to understand what we do, who we are. And that trust and respect is a two-way street, that it's uh, an expectation that they have, but it's also an expectation that we have in our covenant with them. That we wanted to also be clear about um, where they could share their concerns if they had them, um, and to do that with the right person. And it's not always the nurse. <laughs> it might be someone else in the organization that needs to hear that feedback. We know for sure, and you know, the work of the Daisy Foundation has only made it more and more evident of how important gratitude is. And so a simple thing, you know, like thank you would make a lot of difference to many nurses. Now that said, as nurses, we also have work to do to be able to receive that gratitude and not to push it away and say, oh, I'm just doing my job. Anybody said that? This is to take in the appreciation and really let it be a resource to us when we have done our best, when we actually have served very well in often very difficult circumstances. So to be able to say thank you for noticing, thank you for seeing that. Doing, um, engaging with conversation with our patients about what they could do to lighten our nurses' workload. Now, I'm not saying that we want to, you know, allocate all the, the responsibility to patients or their care partners, but there certainly is an opportunity to, to say, let's see how we can work together to achieve the outcomes that are important to both of us and you in particular as a patient. How do we help them to get factual, accurate information? And we all know there's a lot of misinformation out there. But if we are the most trusted, then how do we use that trust in a way that actually facilitates their understanding? Encourage them to ask questions and not to be passive consumers of healthcare. Nurses and patients can partner together to, to be advocates for being able to get those questions answered. Partner with nurses in ways that are really important to patients in terms of their care. And certainly we want them to be an ally and that could take many, many forms. It could take forms in a, a community, in a neighborhood, in a hospital. And certainly we want them to be informed voters. And what we mean by that is they should, we should be offering them questions to ask potential political candidates, how they plan to support the nursing workforce. 
what are their policy proposals for how to address the gaps in the healthcare system, in our workforce, in the healthcare organizations, in all kinds of settings where nurses practice. So we need to be engaging them in really robust ways so that they can actually take their appreciation and fuel it toward actually helping both of us to do what we are meant to do. So I think we're down to Q&A. And I think yes, we um, we're going to see what questions have come up. Great. But Thank we, you. Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. Gonna, <laughs> I was just going to add one statement uh, to what Cinda just said. Um, you know, I would encourage all nurses to share the what the public can do um, the blog information with their families and have their families share it with their friends and colleagues and so forth. Um, you know, given that there are so many of us as you know, we're the largest uh, healthcare uh, workforce, you know, the opportunity to educate the people in our own circles, we have, and then have them share it with folks in their circles, I think really give us the, the chance to, uh, expand this message far beyond just our immediate sphere of influence. Again, thank you both so much. This was such an insightful um, and pretty powerful presentation. I know the audience appreciated it because we have a lot of questions. So I'm gonna start with this one. I'm gonna throw this to you, Cinda, just start out. It's tempting to focus exclusively on fixing the system, but what can we, but what do we do in the short term? Well, that's a great question and one that I think um, is uh, really important, especially in this in this context. Um, you know, our system did not arrive as it is right now overnight. It's been decades as we talked about the patterns that were present before COVID has only been intensified. So I think we have to commit to working at both levels and what I mean by that is the one thing that every nurse has control over is your own practice. And I think we have to claim that that is something that we can decide how we are gonna practice. Obviously there will be constraints, but with the resources and time that we have, we also have to use our power and how we practice to be part of this change process. We, we need to work together. We cannot have division at this point in our history. We must stand together. We have to have a shared vision. We have to speak in one voice so that our message is not scattered, it's not dismissed, it's not somehow relegated as noise, which is what Eileen was talking about in the beginning. If we can, can overcome some of our own internal challenges and create the narrative of how we want to be known and understood, we have to start with ourselves. And so from that place, I think we have the opportunity to harness that uh, that commitment, uh, that uh, vision to, to really amplify it collectively. Would you like to add anything to that, Eileen? Um, no, I just want to highlight somebody's statement. I think it's, I'm going to, I'm going to shout out to Deb Bershad. She wrote, stand tall, stand proud and stand together. So I just think that needs some amplification. That's great. Um, here's a question, kind of maybe can be related to what we just asked. Um, what are your thoughts on nurses obtaining their national nurse identifier? Do you want to take that one, Eileen? Um, certainly. Yeah, yes, and there there are a couple of different movements for nursing uh, for nurses to have a national identifier because that will allow us to collect information about the actual care that is provided by nursing. Right now, there are very few ways within the hospital setting to document 
and quantify care that is provided uh, to patients. Uh, you know, our current healthcare system really works around identifying procedures, tasks, things like that, that then are assigned a monetary value. Right now, there are very few ways to do that when it comes to nursing care. So we have to have ways to be able to collect that data, to be able to identify what it is, the unique contribution that nursing provides to the care of a patient. And this is particularly true within the acute care setting, but it also applies in the ambulatory care setting as well. So that once we uh, have that data, we, can, we have something to then go to health systems to say, this is how nursing contributes to the value, to the product, to the resources, to the profits of this organization. Without that data, um, we're missing a key variable that's essential to making strong arguments um, at those tables where financial decisions are being made. And let's not kid ourselves. You know, healthcare almost represents 20% of our gross domestic product, somewhere around 17, 18%. It is about money and resources. And so we need to have a much better understanding of what the nursing uh, care contributes to the delivery of health care, what it costs, but also what it brings in. And when we think about, um, you know, the kinds of care that the kinds of nursing education, uh, patient education, the kinds of things that nurses do that prevent readmissions or that reduce hospital lengths of stay or that allow a, a parent to understand what's going on with their child so they're not rushing into the emergency department. Those are all factors that nurses and ways that nurses contribute value to the healthcare system. And so things like the National Nurse Identifier um, will allow us to collect that information, that data, be able to put some numbers to the care and have a much stronger foundation on which to make these arguments about what more resources need to be put into nursing education, nursing practice, and so forth. Um, I want to jump in just real quick because somebody else made a comment here. Nursing should be acknowledged as a profession, not as a workforce. And I'm imagining that the identifier will help would help to move that perspective forward. Well, but I, I, I also I just want to add that I think, you know, this is an and not an or. Um, right. We are a profession, but we must also recognize that our profession is a very substantial part of the healthcare workforce. And our profession is grounded in unique knowledge, unique skills. Um, but we want to acknowledge that as a larger group, we contribute to the delivery of health care and the development of health in communities. And so it's I don't think it's an either or question. It's an and statement. Gotcha. So I have a question here that actually harkens back to the poll question. Um, and this this came up a couple of times. I noticed um, as you were speaking, people were asking the question in one form or the other. Um, do you think the answers are I am that do you think the answers are I am a nurse are reflective of what of what generation the nurse is in? So is it a generational thing that people say I'm just a nurse? Is it a generational thing that people say proudly I am a nurse? I don't know. If that's <laughs> or not. Um, to be honest, I think that um, I think the way that we use our words to describe ourselves is often more a reflection of our inner state and our own confidence in ourselves and in, the, in what we do. Uh, I think there's also, there may be some cultural aspects where there's, you know, nurses are not supposed to be boastful or, you know, we are humble. You can claim your space and still be humble. Um, but there, there are some norms that have been spoken and unspoken in our profession that may may fuel this this sort of stance. It may be gender related, and so I, I think that the reason to explore the words we use 
is how powerful the words are in creating the narrative about ourselves. And if we want to be known differently, we need to take responsibility for creating that narrative and not leaving it to be created by others. So I, I, I really feel like this is a huge leverage point for us in our profession right now that we are at this critical juncture where we need to reintroduce ourselves to ourselves, to our communities, to the public in a way that is more reflective of who we really are. So um, I have had the opportunity to work with a lot of nurses over these last months and have been asking them that exact question. And what's interesting to me is how many of them aren't really aware of how they speak about themselves and the, the impact that has on others and that has on themselves. And yet when offered the opportunity to say, well, how do you want to be known? They've got a whole different narrative to, to share at that point. Um, so I would just encourage us to, to inquire into that question and see how we might refine that response um, and what happens when we do. Can I jump in and add something? Um, you know, as a as an educator, uh, being a dean, I think this um, for those of us in the audience who who are educators, I think this is our opportunity to really make sure that as we are educating the next generation of nurses, that we are ensuring that they do develop that way of thinking about themselves, that they. Um, are able to speak uh, to their skills, to their knowledge, to that they are able to represent to the public what what nursing is about and what nursing what nurses have done through the centuries, but also what nurses are doing today uh, to provide care and to um, develop health in communities. So I think that's incumbent upon us um, whether. You know, whether it is a generational thing, whether it's a gender thing, you know, Cindy and I have had lots of conversations about this. Um, but I think for mm. those of us in positions of influencing, particularly individuals entering into nursing, we need to ensure that this is a conversation from day one so that they own their profession in a way that supports the profession moving forward. Thanks, Eileen. So this next question I just noticed, I think was probably um, written while you were talking earlier about the whole shared vision. So the question is, in addition to a shared vision, can you address our internal challenges of mentoring others? There are many learners pursuing pre-licensure nursing programs. At times, professional nurses decline mentoring or working with future nurses. Yeah. Um. I'm sure Eileen has something to say about that too, is um, I guess one of the things I wonder in, in that question is um, I think part of what's happening in our healthcare environment right now, especially in acute care, and uh, is that um, nurses are exhausted and they, they really are struggling to be able to provide for the people that are assigned to them and also then to be involved in, in educating the next generation. Um, at the same time, <clears throat> we have patterns in our profession that have not been helpful to us. You know, this, this languaging of eating our young. And many nurses have experienced that exact thing as they have entered into practice. And so we, we need to take a step back as well and look at internally into our profession of what is it that drives that behavior. Some of it may be uh, patterns of oppression that we have experienced. It may be lots of other factors. But at the same time, the responsibility to create the norms in the profession of how we are gonna be together is our internal work to do. 
and it starts uh, from the first day of nursing school. How we do group projects. Is it a competitive environment? Is it an environment where there's uh, shame and blame that is foisted upon people? Is that our model? I think these are the places where we have work to do internally um, to, to really create a different kind of mm -hmm. environment that dismantles some of those patterns. Eileen? Thank you so much, Cinda, for that. Um, I think um, to, I would just simply add that, um, you know, as a dean of a school of nursing, um, where we are always uh, stuck in this challenge of, of finding clinical placements for our learners um, and ensuring that they're having good experiences in the clinical setting, I would say that this is our opportunity as a profession to um, move the profession forward the caliber and quality of experiences that, that learners have in the clinical setting really are formative for their professional um, trajectory. And so I absolutely appreciate the, the challenges that our, our, our colleagues are having, um, especially in areas where they have not been supported. Um, and I would ask our colleagues that, you know, what would you like to change? What, um, and use this as an opportunity through the next generation of, of nurses to create those kinds of relationships. Um, perhaps be the mentor that you never had. Uh, take that step forward to provide the educational experience that perhaps you never had. Um, this is, this is our opportunity. And secondly, again, to those educators who are on and, and other deans that are on this webinar, um, along with uh, chief nursing officers and department heads and so forth, this is the time that we as nursing leaders in both practice and academia need to be working together to find solutions about how do we make this um, this sort of partnership work so that um, on the education side, we're not scrambling and on the practice side, we're not, um, you know, beating nurses into the ground with fatigue and, and just, um, you know, over utilizing them and not giving them the resources that they need. There's got to be a happy medium somewhere um, because we can't exist without our practice partners and if we don't exist, there won't be any future workforce um, to provide reprieve. So, you know, I think it's incumbent upon every level of nursing to think about how are we creating that next generation of nurses and how we take steps forward to um, eliminate those negative past practices um, and work more towards a much more positive and sustainable workforce of the future. Um, so I think that would be that would be my call. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so in changing how organ organizations budget for nursing, how can we change years of insufficient resource allocation? You want to take that, Cinda or Eileen? Well, I think there's a there's an opportunity here. We cur we cannot change the past. That's done. The only option we have is how do we want to change the current reality for the future? And those patterns I think are very important for us to pay attention to. The budget is the most important ethical document in an organization. It reflects what we care about. It reflects what we are investing in. And I think there is a real time where we have got to come together with our chief financial officers and other leaders and organizations to examine and revise our assumptions about budgeting for nursing services. Because until we have that new conversation we're probably gonna see the patterns of the past repeated. They're not working. So how do we have 
in our organization's mechanisms to quantify nurses' contributions in a different way how we can be accountable and transparent in how those resources that are always limited, how they are allocated and what the assumptions are that guide their allocation. So we've talked a lot, uh, Eileen and I too, in, and in other contexts about we need a more explicit ethical framework for how we allocate our scarce resources that include our scarce human resources. The human resource allocation has to be approached with the same rigor, the same discipline as we allocate other resources. So during COVID, I spent sometimes twice a day meetings about how we were gonna allocate ventilators. We ought to put that same attention and effort into examining how we are gonna allocate our scarce human resources. So there, there's a shift that has to happen uh, to create the new future. And it's gonna, it's gonna be painful, but out of pain, as we all know, there's the process for new progress to be made. Eileen, you wanna add? No, I think you said it so eloquently, Cinda. Well, then I want to finish with this last question, which I think is a perfect thing to end on. Um, we have an audience member who has asked each of you to share your 30 second elevator pitch on this topic. So Cinda, you can start. On the topic of the social contract? Yes. Okay. So my 30 second elevator pitch would be, I am a nurse. I am trained and skilled to journey with you in your disease process and beyond. And I am here to offer my skill, my presence, and my compassion as a partner in that journey. And you can count on me to be your advocate, to be your voice when needed, and to listen when you need to share your concerns. Thank you, Cinda. Oh boy, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a nurse. I am a compassionate advocate for individuals, families, communities, and the world when it comes to health and health development. It's my goal to make sure that I am there when each of my patients needs me, whether that be to answer questions, whether that be to hold a hand, whether that be to help them clean up after themselves, it's my desire to be there to support them in their dignity as a human being. Uh, I'm educated, I have experience, and I wish to be there at the hardest times and at the happiest times. I am a nurse. I am there for my patients. Well, that was actually quite perfect, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, this was really a moving presentation. And I know the audience loves us because I'm seeing hearts and likes and hand claps coming up over the screen. So thank you again for your time and thank you to the audience as well and to SUNY 